This session is part of the planning section. We will be introducing some concepts and methodologies that will help you focus on the organization of your mobilization project at a number of levels. The focus in this session will be on tasks and the ways in which they can be organized in order to prepare practical workable plans and clear documentation. The successful implementation of your project is dependent in large part on the development of realistic, efficient and streamlined processes, workflows and documentation. This, combined with the constant assessment of changes to the landscape within which your project exists, will drastically increase the likelihood of its success. In this section, we will look at three methodologies for clustering the timing and ordering of the tasks and components identified as critical to the goals of the project. We will then see how good planning is supported by continuous documentation. Let's take a quick look at the definition of the noun cluster. It is defined as a group of similar things or people positioned or occurring closely together. The three important parts of the definition for us are groups, similarity and things. What we will see is that in order to successfully achieve your mobilization goals, you will need to be able to identify groups and arrangements of similar tasks, cluster them together and then string those clusters together into a logical flow. In plain terms, we will now be looking at the when and how of your project. Let's look first at groupings. Probably the simplest grouping to be able to identify in your project are stages relative to a fixed point in time. What we mean here is that at what time during the project should any particular task or group of tasks occur? The simplest, but by no means the only way of stage grouping, uses digitization as its reference point. In this example, before refers to any time before the start of the digitization effort itself, i.e. the imaging and transcription. During relates specifically to the period of active digitization, and after is the period after the digitization effort has ended. Another common reference point is the start and end of funding. You can use anything that makes sense and even use different reference points for different stakeholders and groups of tasks that run concurrently. These points are often also good places to insert milestones with metrics for your project. The next set of groupings is PMBOK. PMBOK stands for Project Management Body of Knowledge and is the entire collection of processes, best practices, terminologies and guidelines that are accepted as standards within the project management industry. It is overseen by the Project Management Institute, which is a global not-for-profit member organization of project managers. The first edition of PMBOK was published in 1996 and is now on its fifth edition, which was published in 2013. As a very high level synopsis, the methodology uses iterative and repeatable groupings to cluster tasks together. The stages are initiating, planning, executing, monitoring and closing. Tasks carried out during the initiating phase should define the new project or the part of the project being tracked. For example, obtaining collection permits or MOUs before going into the field. Tasks carried out during the planning phase are required to establish the scope of the project, for example, assessing the physical state of a collection before pulling specimens for imaging. Tasks carried out during the executing phase are those that accomplish the project's stated deliverables, for example, the transcription of label data. The monitoring phase is an overarching and overlapping phase. The tasks assigned to it serve the function of watchdog over the planning and executing phases, ensuring that performance is on track. Finally, tasks in the closing phase indicate that goals and milestones have been achieved and the project or part of the project in question have finished. This diagram 
shows the continuous flow and cyclical nature of the five PMBOK phases. Task clusters are a defined set of digitization task groups. The term was coined by the ID Bio team in their 2012 paper, Five Task Clusters That Enable Efficient and Effective Digitization of Biological Collections. In the paper, the authors identified five major groups of tasks that are most often found in successful natural history digitization projects. They are pre-digitization curation and staging, specimen image capture, specimen image processing, electronic data capture, and georeferencing locality descriptions. Clustering, as a general concept, is an extremely useful way to organize the detail of the tasks which must be carried out during any particular project stage and divides them up into manageable and trackable chunks. In this diagram of the digitization task clusters, you can see some of the checking and monitoring feedback loops as seen in the PMBOK method. The next examples of clustering that we will look at are generally termed workflows. Workflows are defined as the sequence of processes through which a piece of work passes from initiation to completion. There are three general categories, sequential, rules-driven, and state machine. In simple terms, they are just another way that you can join tasks and task clusters together and apply rules and logic to increase efficiency. We will look at the three workflow types by describing in increasing detail a common digitization workflow. Sequential workflows are simple and represent a unidirectional series of steps with a single start and end point. The important point being that each task must be completed before the next one can start. In this example, the sequence is name checking, followed by photography, then data entry, and finally proofreading. Rules driven workflows often have an underlying sequential element as described previously. However, within each task cluster, rules and logic can alter the progress of the workflow. Here in this example, in the lower right corner, in the photography task cluster, there is a quality check logic gate. If there is a problem with the image, it is discarded and the specimen goes back to be photographed again only when the quality check has been passed can the con workflow continue. Machine state workflows are the next most complex form. Here, the steps within each task cluster can happen asynchronously, i.e. they are not necessarily performed one after another, but instead can be triggered by actions and states in previous steps. One state is assigned as the start state, and then, Based on an event, a transition is made to another state, and so on. If we take this example from Allard 2012, let's say that the photography lab is only allowed to hold 60 herbarium sheets at any one time. The name checking task cluster can continue to prep specimens, but there is a check that means specimens cannot pass to the photography task cluster until there is space. Meanwhile, the other task clusters can also carry on as long as they have specimens or images to work on. In this next short section, Elements of a Good Plan, we will look at how documentation aids good planning. We will highlight the benefits of good documentation, make connections between the proposal, planning and implementation documents, and show how the elements of each build together thereby reducing the agony of the last minute end of project report. The definition of a plan is a detailed proposal for doing or achieving something. Documentation of your project should describe not only what you plan to do, but also what you actually did. 
Its primary purpose is to communicate with all stakeholders in order to provide an exact account of expectations, responsibilities and achievements. Thorough documentation has many benefits. It provides accountability. Everyone should know what they are responsible for and also what others are responsible for. It ensures integrity. Do what you say you will do, especially where sensitive data is concerned. It provides protection. A good plan helps you avoid scope creep and unexpected requests. It provides proof of compliance, allowing you to show that you have followed the standards that you said you would. It enhances availability and your plan should always be available. There shouldn't be anything hidden at this stage. It documents retention. How long will the data created by this project remain fresh? What needs to happen to keep it up to date? It documents disposition. What is the ownership of the data created by the project? Who will be responsible for it after the end of the project? Good documentation encourages transparency. Openly sharing practical project plans, feedback into the community and allow others to learn from your successes and failures. Lastly, it promotes teamwork. All stakeholders benefit from knowing how they fit into the larger picture and the more of a sense of ownership that they have, the more likely your project is to succeed. All of the resource elements that we have discussed in the previous section come together in the project documentation. The elements of your documentation overlap. Let's have a look at where in the documentation cycle each element appears. We won't cover much about the detail of creating a proposal, except to say that if it got you the funding, then it did a good job. The proposal will contain the high level description of purpose and rationale and a good faith description of a work plan as achievable at the time of writing. The planning document or implementation plan, on the other hand, should give everyone involved at the start of the project a complete guide to how the project will actually get done. This is where you should include the practicalities, workflows for specific goals, resource allocations to tasks, milestones and targets. The planning document should be a living entity that the project manager revisits regularly as they keep track of milestones and approach checkpoints. Workflows should be adjusted and redocumented as the landscape changes to make sure that interim goals are kept on track. If this is done, then progress reports, which occur at checkpoints throughout the project, are easy to compile. Metrics can be reported and any changes in the project landscape highlighted for risk mitigation. The compilation of the final report then becomes the less daunting task of summarising the previous progress reports and the planning document. In a circular fashion, your planning document now can be used in your next project proposal and has the benefit of being a tried and tested successful plan. To review the sections, clustering the components and elements of a good plan, we looked at three ways to arrange tasks together into feasible workflows. Groupings are ways to divide a project into manageable stages based on specific criteria, for example, time. They are helpful ways to determine milestones in planning documents and mark progress for interim reports. Task clusters were used to describe one of the most common sets of natural history digitization tasks and their ordering while workflows were explained as ways for you to connect tasks and task clusters into logical sequences with criteria and logic to describe the actualities of day-to-day -day project working. Lastly, we looked at how project documentation is a continuous process that begins with the proposal and should be considered a task in its own right. Continuous refinement of your documentation is essential to the successful communication of your project at all stages and will help you and your team know what they should be doing at any particular time. You will learn more about documentation of your actual data in further sessions in this course. In Chapter 4 of The Hobbit, Bilbo and the unfortunate dwarves are captured by goblins, chained together in the dark and led deep into the caverns and tunnels of the Misty Mountains. 
This may indeed be your first reaction to starting out on your practical plan, but remember that being physically clustered together made it easier for the dwarfs to stay together and they escaped. It was by getting detached that Bilbo was lost. Of course, he found the ring as a result, but that's another story for another time. If you have questions on this presentation, please use the provided forum in the e-learning platform. This video is part of a series of presentations used in the GBIF Biodiversity Data Mobilization course. The Biodiversity Data Mobilization curriculum was originally developed as part of the Biodiversity Information Development Program funded by the European Union. This presentation was originally created and narrated by Sharon Grant with additional contributions by BID and BIFA trainers, mentors and students. Thank you.